Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Disability in Medicine alumni panel sponsored by the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association, the Stanford Medicine Abilities Coalition, and the Department of Pediatrics. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our four panelists. And I'm just going to introduce them very briefly as I'm going to let them share their own stories. Dr. Sharon Drost, class of 2002, is a Stanford educated and trained adult neurologist and a member of the Medical Advisory Board of Doximity Incorporated. Dr. Maite von Hentenrich, class of 21, is a first year pediatrics resident at Stanford. And while a medical student, also at Stanford, she co founded a new student group, the Medical Students with Disabilities and Chronic Illness, or NSDCI, to activate, to advocate for disability inclusion and create a supportive community for students as they navigate a career in medicine. Dr. Blake Charlton, class of 2013, is an interventional cardiologist with the Alaska Heart and Vascular Institute. He is also a novelist and the author of the, the Spellwright Trilogy. And last but not least, Dr. Sherry Blowett, class of 09, is an assistant professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School and an attending physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. She is also a Paralympic athlete in wheelchair racing, bringing home a total of seven Paralympic medals. Good evening to our panelists. Hi, I'm Sharon Drost. I am a uh, adult neurologist and, and uh, basically I had a double lung transplant uh, eight and a half years ago. Uh, I was a medical student and an intern and a resident and a chief resident and had no issues whatsoever. And I was actually fairly active, triathlete, et cetera. And one day I was pushing my baby daughter's uh, stroller up a hill at the San Diego Zoo. And it's very, a very steep hill. And I just could not push that stroller up the hill and had to ask uh, the grandfather in the group to actually help. And when I got back from vacation, uh, I sought some further care, but I had an idea that uh, this was something autoimmune. I had had some uh, very minor issues with Reynolds, uh, things of that nature, but I didn't consider uh, that it was anything having to do with uh, an autoimmune disease. Well, in fact, it was uh, scleroderma and uh, it initially presented very benignly. Um, and so I continued my practice. I had a private practice in Los Gatos. It was really lovely, just uh, 10 minutes from my home um, pretty much set up exactly the way I wanted it. Everything was was uh, working perfectly. In fact, I, I like to say that in heels, I could get to the emergency room uh, across the street in uh, under a minute. And uh, that's actually, uh, I think the, the ladies here might understand why that was actually kind of a feat. Um, so I was given the diagnosis of scleroderma and my pulmonary function tests initially were uh, not too bad, but uh, they steadily uh, deteriorated to the point where I had to decide if I was going to continue my private practice. Now in private practice, I'm uh, responsible not just for my, my own uh, patients, but also uh, my staff and also the call group the group of neurologists that I also shared um, responsibility of taking care of, of their call on the weekend. Um, so this was a big decision. I needed to be absolutely clear um, and sure in myself that I could perform as needed. Well, unfortunately the breathing problems got worse and worse and it became clear that I needed to close the practice. So I sold my practice and I did that over a period of nine months or so in order to make sure that my patients were transferred to, um, to neurologists that they felt very comfortable with. 
and who uh, could continue their care. And uh, as such, um, I went on to soon thereafter need a double lung transplant. And that was a, uh, an interesting process being on the other side of the stethoscope. Um, not typically a place that us physicians are comfortable being. Uh, anyway, that all went uh, relatively well. It was a complicated surgery, um, went a little longer than uh, anticipated. And the recovery was as promised, uh, fairly difficult. Um, but after all of that, I think um, an overwhelming sense of optimism and feeling that the future held so much and there was no way to, to give up after so much work in medical school and training, et cetera. And also for the, all of my, my colleagues and people who I trained with and my family, et cetera. So I think for me, dealing with a chronic illness is something that makes me appreciate life every single day. And uh, I believe that making gratitude a habit is something that we can all look to and see how lives are better, even if we feel different than others. Um, and I think also that with chronic illnesses, and in my case, immunosuppression especially, uh, unfortunately, we've all learned for protecting each other with vaccinations and social distancing and masking and um, personal hygiene, hand washing, et cetera. Uh, and I think that that was initially something that was not readily understood by other people. I remember going on a Disney cruise when my daughter was just a few years old and I had a t-shirt made that said, pardon my mask, I have a double lung transplant. And uh, it really did seem to help because uh, people were more careful um, with covering their coughs and washing their hands, et cetera. So overall, I think chronic illness is a drop in the bucket compared to uh, some of the disabilities you'll hear my colleagues on the panel speak about. Thank you, Dr. Drost. I'll do a better handoff this time to Dr. Van Hentenrick, Maite. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Poulos, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so my name is Maite. I'm a first-year pediatrics resident here at Stanford and went to medical school here, too. Graduated just last spring. Um, so when I was 20 months old, I had a pretty severe form of meningitis. So I lost my right leg below the knee, and then I had a lot of different orthopedic problems in both my legs and in my left arm as a result. And so um, growing up, I had a series of different surgeries to correct all of those issues, starting in about first grade and then going through, um, through college. Um, I was really, really fortunate to grow up in a family and in a community that really um, supported me in whatever I wanted to do. So I really didn't think very much about my disability until much, much later in life. Um, actually, not until I graduated from college and started to live out in the real world and started to notice ableism more actively in my life. Um, and then I went to medical school here at Stanford and, and was really excited to join a com community that I thought would really understand everything that I had gone through. And I was super lucky that all of my classmates were incredibly thoughtful and kind, considerate people. But I just continued to think about how in all of our lectures and all the ways that we talk about illness, we always talk about the, the pathology and treatments, but we don't always talk about the patient experience. And um, looking around um, around my classmates and our faculty and all of the mentors that I had, there were very few others with disabilities. Um, and so we started having a few conversations about this, um, me and two of my very good um, friends in med school who also identified as having disabilities. 
and we realized there was a really big need to, to talk about this more. So um, we ended up creating this uh, student group called Medical Students with Disability and Chronic Illness. Um, started off really small, just the three of us, and we'd have um, Ask Me Anything events with our classmates. We had ASL workshops. We held um, panels for minority students that were applying to med school. And um, we, we did as much as we could in the, in the few years that we had before going off into our clerkships when we'd have less time to, to work on this. And um, we, we were kind of unsure about where the group would go in, in the next few years, but I don't know why we were worried because the next group of students just really took MSDCI and ran. And it's just been so incredible for me to see how much the group has grown in the last few years. Um, they've done a bunch of research looking at the needs of our community. They've worked very closely with Dr. Poulos and SMAC and everyone. Um, they are um, working on a mentorship program between all levels of training. They're working with the med school to make our clerkship experience more accessible. And there's now uh, an MSDCI national across the whole country with 12 different chapters to work on this. So um, I've been super humbled by how much this has grown and, and personally just really encouraged by where the conversation has has come in the last two years. And I'm, I'm really excited that this event is happening. I'm excited that there's a lot of, of momentum around disability inclusion. And I hope this, this just continues. Thank you, Dr. Van Antenerick. Dr. Charlton, I'd um, like to hear from you next. Hi there, um, my name is Blake Charlton, hello. Um, with my five minutes, I'd like to tell you a brief version of my life story as a form of thank you uh, and encouragement to Stanford's efforts to be inclusive. Uh, I was born with a very severe form of dyslexia. I rode the short bus to special ed like many people do. I didn't learn to read with any fluency until I was about 13 years old. At that time, I was told I, on no uncertain terms, I should consider going to college. I, however, had very crafty patient, uh, parents who um, would read to me every night and notice that as a young boy, I was very fascinated by any book that had either a dragon or a rocket ship on the cover. And so they surrounded me with these books. And because I love that literature, I struggled with books enough to learn to read. And with a lot of accommodations and a lot of help and with a lot of struggling, I did go to college and I did fairly well. And thereafter, I became a special education teacher. Um, and during this time, I decided what I really wanted to do was write novels. Um, and I would write novels of uh, the fantasy and science fiction ilk that I loved so much when I was young and inspired me to read. And I would uh, only have uh, disabled characters. And I did not do well. I didn't sell any books. So I was uh, uh, very discouraged. And um, uh, because I had done fairly well in science classes, I decided I still wanted to make a difference. And so I would apply to become uh, to a medical school. And I think back with a little chagrin because on my application essays, um, I stated I was going to become, I was certain, a pediatric neurologist, and I was going to run a wet lab and uh, do research on neurodiversity uh, and get lots of NIH funding and unlock the secrets of the neurons and glia and all these things. Um, and uh, the admission committee maybe uh, looked past my naivete of thinking I knew what I wanted to do um, and took a chance on me, even though I was neurodiverse and there weren't, wasn't a lot of experience with that and uh, the accommodations weren't exactly clear how that was gonna work at that time. Um, but Stanford was wonderful. I had many wonderful med uh, mentors, most importantly, Dr. Abraham Verghese um, was a wonderful clinical mentor, got me interested in adult medicine and was later a mentor for me as a writer. Um, and Stanford allowed me to take some time to write. And I'm happy to say the books eventually got published. I'm proud that they've been published in seven different languages. And then most importantly, I had the opportunity to write an opinion piece for the New York Times about uh, how the diagnosis of dyslexia in particular and neurodiversity in general was changing and how there were good and bad things associated with dyslexia in particular, and it shouldn't be thought of as solely a negative thing. And for a very brief time, it was the most shared article on the New York Times. Even my aunt knew that I wrote things. 
um, and the International Dyslexia Association gave me their Pinnacle Award, which was a real honor. But really, looking back, the most important thing happened is that another uh, educator, or I guess I wasn't an educator, but someone who was still in education wrote a piece called Dyslexia and the Poor, and they made the accurate argument that my, what I was describing was dyslexia for the rich and for the privileged. And um, that really allowed me to start to understand things about inequities and access and privilege, particularly how they understand to people, to apply to people with disabilities. Um, I didn't think about it a lot because at that time I moved uh, 60 miles north of Stanford to uh, some other institution where I trained in internal medicine and then cardiology and, and UCSF was wonderful. And I had wonderful mentors there, Dr. Um, uh, Rita Redberg, uh, the editor of uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, and I put together an editorial fellowship and I got to do the research you should do when you're a medicine resident and write the things you should write. But I, the most important thing that happened to me there happened to do with the people I met and what they taught me. And in particular, I remember a very busy primary care clinic where I had a no-show that felt like a gift from God because maybe I wouldn't be 90 minutes late for the next patient. But in walks in this triage nurse and she looks at me and says, you know, I have the most heartbreaking, difficult walk-in you can imagine out there. And you're the only physician who can help me. Will you help me? And to be totally honest with you, I, I normally would have tried to weasel my way out of it, but um, this was a really cute nurse I had been trying to meet for a few months and hadn't figured out how to talk to um, and said, I'd be happy to help um, with this heartbreaking and difficult case. And it was really heartbreaking and difficult. And at the end of many hours, we ended up calling adult protective services and all these really difficult things. And uh, that particular nurse and I were there very late. And I mentioned how well we worked together. And I wondered if she could keep me updated about the patient. And I might have given her my phone number and asked her out to coffee. And she looked at me and said, well, I don't date doctors ever. And so I did what any reasonable man would do. I, I tried to wear her down. And I became her friend. And I learned that she was a nurse practitioner. She was learning to be a primary care provider for uh, underserved rural and particularly indigenous people. Um, and um, I successfully, I don't really know how, but towards the end of our training convinced her to marry me. Uh, and in 2020, when I was an interventional cardiology fellow and learned, having to learn way too much about COVID's untowards effect on the heart and how to crash someone onto ECMO and all these awful things, um, she was helping me learn the much more important messages about social responsibility the inequities of our society, the systemic racism it's built on. So even though our wedding was canceled and even though our honeymoon was canceled, she did the next best thing. And we answered a call from the Navajo Nation and we became motelists there. I'm saying that correctly. I'm like not a hospitalist, but a motelist. So if you were a member of the Navajo Nation or the Zuni Nation and you had COVID, but you couldn't be admitted because you weren't sick enough, but you couldn't go back to your multi-generational living situation, you got a all expenses paid trip to Gallup, New Mexico, where you got either to stay at the Quality Inn, where my then fiance who took care of you, or the Hojos, um, where I would take care of you. And in retrospect, even though it was incredibly difficult, heartbreaking, scary, we didn't have anything to treat the virus then. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better honeymoon than Hojos in Gallup, New Mexico, which all of you should visit. It's a very strange place, but. Um, when all that was happening, uh, we were looking for a job uh, where we could both uh, uh, be of use to uh, inequalities. There's not a lot of overlap between rural primary care and interventional cardiology, but we found that here in Anchorage, Alaska. And I don't think I ever would have ended up here as a physician had I not had an experience with disabilities and trying to understand how privilege played into how I was able to do what I was doing, everything that was given to me in terms of accommodations and tutoring. Um, and we thought when we were leaving Navajo that we were not going to be on the front line of anything ever again. And I'm sure everyone here has heard that Alaska has been leading the world in uh, COVID cases per capita. And we have extremely few resources and everything you've read about on the news about how horribly difficult it is um, to make these decisions and try to save people 
Uh, it's all true. It's all actually worse. Um, but I'm really proud that I get to be part of this, that I get to be a, a contribute to trying to make this crisis less, to try to figure out how to do it in an equitable way. Um, and when I think back to that admissions essay to Stanford saying I was going to get a lot of NIH funding and I was going to be a scientist and I haven't done any of those things. And I think an interventional cardiologist is by as far from a pediatric neurologist as you can get. Um, but I just that gift that Stanford gave me by accepting me as a neurodiverse person and validating that I could go off and, and do that and everything that opened my eyes, my eyes to really has made me grateful has made me hope that my story will be taken as advice. Oh, and I got a lot of great uh, experiences for the next novel. But um, anyway, um, I just hope that Stanford will look at stories like mine when they decide to be inclusive and they can see that, you know, it's, it's really a wonderful and magic thing. And I'm so grateful I got it. And I hope they continue to give it to other people. So thank you so much for listening. I'm sure I went over. No worries, that was enthralling. Thank you so much, Dr. Charlton. Uh, last but not least, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Sherry Blowett. Thanks, Pete. Um, man, it's pretty intimidating to go after the great storyteller, Blake Charlton. <laughs> Good to see you, Blake. I feel like this is like a, a wonderful reunion of so many wonderful people. Um, so it's really, yeah, a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I am absolutely thrilled that we're taking the time to have this conversation about disability as a really important element of diversity in medicine. Um, as Pete introduced, my name is uh, Dr. Sherry Blowett. I uh, graduated from Stanford in 2009 after a really long and winding road to the, the field of medicine. Um, I'm not a native Californian. Um, I'm actually a, a, initially a farm kid from the Midwest and I grew up on a small family farm. I was born um, with no disability, but acquired a traumatic spinal cord injury um, at the age of 16 months due to a farming, um, farming accident on our family farm. And um, of course I, I don't have any memory of the event itself. Um, I'm sure it was definitely one of those lucky to be alive moments, but here I am. Um, and growing up in the rural Midwest in the 80s, pre-ADA, um, you know, in that time of my life, my MO was really um, to learn how to assimilate and blend in and, and get things done through creativity and, um, and uh, you know, a lot of support from, from family and friends. Um, thinking back on that time of my life, interestingly, when I, uh, you know, really now contemplate what made the difference in terms of me, you know, really developing into someone, um, you know, a student and then ultimately a physician with, uh, you know, a mindset towards setting big goals. I, I realize now that I have a lot of credit to give, really all the credit to give to my mom. Um, at that time, my mom was a nurse. And um, after my injury, she was the one who really quickly uh, recognize that I was still the same kid, even though I moved around in a different way and that I still needed to be challenged. Uh, I still had to help out with chores around the house. I still had to get good grades and that you couldn't just cut me all this slack because I was a young kid with a disability. Um, so of course, continued growing up in the Midwest. Um, I had an interesting turning point in my early life when in eighth grade, I learned about the whole world of adaptive sports. Um, prior to that, I had gotten involved in many things in my school, but they were all fairly sedentary, you know, things like band and student council and debate club and such. And I had a track coach um, in our small public school who learned about the sport of wheelchair racing because he saw a couple of exhibition events on TV. And he invited me to come out for the track team. And uh, immediate, initially, I immediately turned him down because I didn't self-identify as an athlete. But with a lot of coaxing, I gave it a try. And um, with a lot of work to sort of gain exposure in the sport, ultimately learned about the whole world of adaptive sport, um, learned about some junior wheelchair racing teams that practiced in the Midwest, um, started to go to various trainings in cities that were three or four hours away, just because I, that was the only way I could access the opportunities. And ultimately, by the time I graduated high school, um, this athletic identity had really developed into something that I wanted to pursue 
So sport was the thing that got me off the family farm and um, drew me down to Arizona, to the University of Arizona, where I spent uh, four years and became, you know, very integrated into their um, collegiate sport program there. And interestingly, Arizona was was actually the place where I identified a a strong, uh, positive sense of of self-identity as a person with a disability. You know, many of you may know it's a campus, one of the campuses in our country that has the most progressive uh, uh, and developed uh, areas of disability student services. Um, It's a very accessible campus. Uh, The disability community is very visible there. And through both sports as well as the the um, support of that community, you know, really developed a different sense of confidence um, and um, uh, and alignment with the disability community and disability advocacy. Um, while I was a student there, um, started to compete at the national level and then international level, and ultimately qualified for my first Paralympic Games, and suddenly was sort of catapulted into this world of elite sport and um, ultimately ended up riding that wave and competing internationally for the uh, US Paralympic team for about 10 years. Uh, Competed in three Paralympic games in Sydney, Athens, and Beijing and brought home a bunch of medals. Um, Ultimately, marathon became one of my main events. And uh, one of my proudest moments in sport was bringing home two wins in the wheelchair division of Boston in 2004 and 2005. Um, so really sport was my first career, but nobody can compete in sport for their whole lives. So I always had to think about what came next. Um, and through that whole time, I stayed on my educational journey, always felt like medicine would be a good fit, l- largely because of the influence of my mom who worked in healthcare and was clearly such an influence on me um, and uh, applied broadly uh, to medical schools that were in warm weather places where I could still train year round. And, um, you know, wanted to go to the, the play, best place where I was accepted, and, and that was Stanford. And again, I, I would echo Blake's comments. I felt just very lucky uh, to be given a chance to come to such a spectacular place for my training. Um, uh, spent uh, six years at Stanford from 2003 to 2000, 2009. Took a couple of leaves of absence along the way uh, to train and compete in the Paralympics. So I stayed on that sort of student-athlete trajectory, even through medical school. And ultimately, by the time I was ready to graduate medical school, I was also ready to move on from elite sport. And um, that really opened up the country geographically because I didn't have to have to live in a warm weather environment anymore. And I ended up coming to the East Coast for my residency training um, at Harvard in internal medicine and then physical medicine and rehabilitation. And that's where uh, I I stayed. So I'm, I'm faculty here now. Um, the last point I wanted to make is, is just related to my experience at Stanford. You know, when I started in 2003, um, I, you know, I I should definitely be fact-checked, but I think I was the first student who was a wheelchair user, uh, to matriculate at Stanford. And, um, I, I just got to say that, that even in that early time, um, you know, I do feel very fortunate because although there was not yet a strong, disability community yet that had developed at the medical school like there is now, um, I uh, was so appreciative of the approach that that, um, all of the faculty took and and the mentorship uh, that I had access to, and particularly the open-minded approach towards thinking about accommodations as this bi-directional conversation, you know, people not making assumptions about what I needed, but rather simply coming to me and asking, and that's really figuring it out together and innovating together uh, so that I could ultimately have the best experience. It's so awesome now to see this culture develop, uh, to see um, this, the, the Abilities Coalition, uh, to see so many wonderful leaders really helping to advance this work and to see Stanford leading the way. And I can't, I, I, I'm not surprised because I feel like Stanford is often on the front edge of thinking about um, some of these uh, important elements of diversity in medicine. Uh, and now I, I'm sure that students that think about applying to medical school who do have various types of disabilities, whether visible or invisible, um, you know, are really uh, seeing Stanford as a, a sought after place to do their training because of the prominence of that culture and um, the myriad impacts that have on that has on enabling people to feel comfortable in disclosing and understanding that they can really focus on their training. 
uh, rather than having to, you know, assimilate or pass as someone who doesn't have a disability, even though they know they may need accommodations. So um, I'll leave it at that and turn it back over to you and, and just really look forward to um, this conversation and dialogue over the next bit of time here. Thanks, Pete. Okay. So I was in such a rush to start and uh, a little nervous that I forgot to introduce myself and realized that I didn't assign anybody else to actually introduce me. So um, I'm Dr. Pete Poulos. I'm the founder and co-chair of the Stanford Medicine Abilities Coalition. Um, I was actually a GI fellow at UC San Francisco, having finished my uh, IM residency there, as did Dr. Charlton, um, when I had a bicycle accident and was paralyzed from the neck down. And again, this was in um, 2003. And uh, luckily, you know, I did get some function back, but very incomplete and decided um, after you know, thinking long and hard about it and in deciding that I wanted to practice with the most independence that I could to switch and become a radiologist. And that's when I came to Stanford in 2004 and um, where I met Sherry and um, finished my training in 2009 and have been on the faculty since 2009. And uh, just very happy to be working with such a great group of people. My experience was also very positive at Stanford in terms of accommodations. Um, some programs made no, uh, you know, were not embarrassed to tell me that they didn't think that I could make it through their programs, that it would be too rigorous and how could somebody in a wheelchair possibly do it? But Stanford took the opposite attitude and said, what an asset. I would be um, with this experience of being both doctor and patient and having trained in internal medicine. And um, like you, um, Sherry, you know, they worked with me to, um, to make sure that I succeeded within the system. And so um, that's where my experience is coming in. And I founded SMAC in 2018, and here we are today. So, um, the first question I want to ask is for everyone, and it's sort of a high level question regarding disability, identity, and language. And so, um, do you yourself identify as disabled or a person with a disability or neither or something else entirely? And I'll start, I'll start with Sharon. Well, it's an interesting question because I, have a chronic illness. And so when you look at me, you don't know that I'm severely immunocompromised. And I've had respiratory syncytial virus twice just from um, coming into the hospital and seeing patients. Um, and the treatment there is very involved. It's a, a week with nebulized medication that's so carcinogenic that the hospital staff has to completely uh, gown up and it has to be in an isolation tent, et cetera. Um, so not fun. So having a chronic illness, even though it's invisible, um, it is taxing, uh, but it's not something that people can typically see. Um, and that makes it difficult. And hence the reason why I had that shirt printed for the Disney cruise to let people know that uh, I'm wearing a mask to protect myself and, uh, and because I'm immunocompromised. Now everyone knows what this means, unfortunately, due to COVID. All right, my take. I, I think of myself as a person with a disability. I am not, I go back and forth on what terminology I, I like, but I think my disability is a really important part of who I am and and why I am here where I am in, in pediatrics and it's something that I'm really proud of um, but I uh, I don't love just just the disabled person just because in the past I've I've felt that um, a couple of times when people have said disabled person, it hasn't always been said the most kindly. So usually I say I'm a person with a disability. Um, 
but I'm not the a big the biggest stickler on the on the language as as I know others in the community are. Lee. So I have a kind of a, a funny story. I remember going to a conference about dyslexia and a lot of us were there. And this one presenter who was very big on this idea of the positive parts of being dyslexic, tried to get the entire room to start chanting dyslexia is a gift. And there was this very snarky teenager next to me who muttered under her breath, like, if it's a gift, I want to give it back. And I remember feeling that exact sentiment that there might be some good things associated with it, but all those years riding the short bus, not being able to read all the schoolyard comments. Um, even to this day, there are a lot of things I have wild and crazy workarounds for because of the tricks my brain plays on English. Um, so I think I, I, I don't distinguish between either disabled or person with a disability. Both are fine with me. I prefer disabled because it's fewer words, but um, in my our particular niche of neurodiversity i don't particularly love the idea of us of our little group trying to pretend like we don't have something that struggles and we don't have a connection to other people and uh, the kind of disability permanence movement yeah sherry yeah um i can go either way too um i would say that you know for many years i i have always stated a preference towards person with a disability and more of the person first language. Um, although I very much respect, um, you know, the, the more recent move of the community to sort of gravitate towards identity first language and, you know, using the phrase disabled person. I'm really okay with either. Um, I do think that because of the generation uh, where I came of age, that um, at that time, you know, gr growing up in the rural Midwest, I do think that if I had identified as um, identity first at that time, that it probably would have been a detriment. Um, and people would have used that as a means of, uh, uh, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally seeing me with more of a biased lens. So I think that my initial preference towards person first language is probably uh, a defense towards those early experiences. Um, and now it's been interesting to me to see, you know, the social media and writings of some people who are now, you know, leaders in our disability community really pushing for identity first language. And I very much respect that as well. I think at the end of the day, the reality is that our culture has shifted and it will continue to shift. Um, and I think remain, you know, keeping an open mind regarding um, uh, the input and opinions of the community and ultimately each individual's preference is the most important thing. Um, what I would say is that what I do push back against is language that um, implicitly brings a judgment with it. So as a wheelchair user, you know, phrases like wheelchair bound really rub me the wrong way. <laughs> you know, to me, my, my wheelchair is my means of mobility and it's my tool through which I see the world and get on international flights and do my job and play sports. And so I have never felt, nor do I currently feel bound to my wheelchair and phrasing like that, I think um, does bring with it a lot of, it, it packs a lot of bias um, and judgment towards someone's experience as a wheelchair user. That's just one example. Um, there are many others, of course, we could be here all night talking about that, but um, I think as long as you go to the person, ask them their preferences and ensure that whatever phrasing and language you're using, um, you know, uh, doesn't bring bias and judgment with it. I think those are the most important principles. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Sharon talked about the issue of chronic illness and hinted at the idea of like visible versus invisible disabilities. And I admire Maite in starting her group calling it med students with disabilities and chronic illness. And I really actually regret my decision of naming it the Abilities Coalition because, you know, it's, it's not, um, I think that I'm learning along the way, but these sort of euphemisms like saying abilities instead of disabilities or differently abled or God forbid special needs or something like that um, is, is rightfully kind of um, discouraged. And so we're going to have a context, contest next month to rename SMAC 
to incorporate the word disability and hopefully chronic illness in there also. So, you know, um, Sherry, while I'm on you, um, I want to ask you a question. So in your uh, 2017 New York Times opinion piece, I use a wheelchair and yes, I'm your doctor, which I loved and recently reread. You said, as a member of the ADA generation, I was blissfully ignorant that my visible disability could in fact derail my success. I simply assumed that I would be evaluated on merit like my peers. I also realized that my athletic success perhaps made me seem more able. I now understand the privilege of that perspective. I cannot completely separate my disability identity from my professional role. And this is really interesting to me, this juxtaposition between the wheelchair as a symbol of disability, but yet this hyper ability in the form of a para-Olympian is an interesting contrast. And I'm wondering how this also influences your self-perception and your perception of others with disabilities or just other people in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Pete. Um, you know, I think that I, I've really thought, you know, at the time when I was applying to medical school, I really did, I mean, looking back now, I'm kind of shocked. Maybe it was youthful naivete, but um, I really did approach the med school application process um, without a lot of thought <laughs> about my disability or what people would think about it. And, um, and I do think part of that was because of coming from a sport background where, um, you know, my, my version of the disability community was all people who had these like fierce athletic identities and, um, and, you know, were very, uh, uh, although they proudly self-identified with the disability community, also had this sort of, you know, front end and leading edge, uh, 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 like ability with the disability, right? And, um, and I think because of, I mean, that was, that was my, my um, lived experience at that time. And all we can bring forward is what we know and our lived experiences. And um, because of that, you know, I applied to broad, med schools broadly. I very openly disclosed my disability in my personal statement. Uh, I am certain that I did not get some callbacks and interviews because of that. Although at the time, I, uh, I, it wasn't even on my mind shockingly. And, um, and, you know, when I got the interview at Stanford and, and some other schools where that I knew, you know, would be sort of top of my list of where I wanted to go. Um, I was very prepared to come into those interviews and those experiences talking about my athletic career and the way in which my identity as a Paralympic athlete made me see disability through this very positive and empowered lens. And, um, and that's what I did. And I do think that at the time it probably gave schools like Stanford, I, I do think it probably had had a role in some of these schools saying, well, we've never admitted a student who's a wheelchair user, we should give it a try. She's probably a good bet, right? <laughs> in terms of somebody who um, could figure it out. And although I have a physical disability, have uh, you know the level of ability where my needs could be accommodated with what the school saw as being reasonable accommodations. I'm sure I was a, you know, an easier bet to many of them than, you know, a, a quad and a power chair user, for example, even though we now know that, of course, whether you're a manual chair user or a power chair user, an athlete, not athlete, you know, everyone can be an excellent physician with the right accommodations. So, um, so, you know, that lived experience at that time, I think, really did color both my perception of the application process. And I do think it probably had a role to play in school's perceptions of me. And although I was frankly pretty ignorant to it, and now just looking back, realize how um, that did probably play a role. Now, you know, many years later, um, uh, and now no longer, you know, living the life of an elite athlete and having more perspective on the broader disability community. Um, you know, I, I feel far more comfortable bringing forward like the, the, a, a sense of vulnerability that I don't feel bad about when I think about my own physical limitations. Um, 
and how that, uh, you know, those limitations still don't hold me back from being an excellent doctor and they can be accommodated. And I think ultimately those that, you know, it, it's positive for my interactions with patients because it creates a, a very, you know, deep sense of uh, common experience and empathy that is hard to replicate in other ways. So um, that's that, you know, th that's part of my journey. And it's interesting because I feel like over all these years, my own self perceptions have evolved um, as have, you know, the perceptions of the community. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the unique aspect of my athletic back background definitely played a role throughout that journey. Thank you. Sharon, um, speaking about disclosure and applications to medical school, I know that you serve on the um, Med School Admissions Committee as an interviewer and a rater. And so uh, when a student speaks about or writes about their disability in the course of that process, how does that affect your opinion of their capability to graduate and become a practicing physician? And how is that informed by your own chronic illness? Well, that's an excellent question. It's a multi-part question here in that, first of all, Stanford, as we all know, and um, for people who don't know Stanford intimately as much as we do, it's a very open, welcoming place. Um, there's a, a, a high value place on innovation, but also equity and excellence. And with that, Stanford does not miss an opportunity to have the very best and brightest join and be part of a, a Stanford medical school class, an MD, PhD program, et cetera. So when, when I personally um, read an application that has uh, that, that where I get the full color of the person, their lived experiences, their challenges, things, their distance travel, the things that they've been through and overcome and seeing also their plans and how do their plans, um, how they're going to use their abilities to accomplish their goals. So it's really a more the merrier opinion. We are impressed more than anything else that look at this person, look at what they've been through. And this is where, this is where they want to keep going. And I think Stanford is the right place for them. Um, for me now, my chronic illness didn't come into play until after med school, after residency, et cetera. Um, but I have colleagues who have disabilities and it does not stop them at all. In, if anything, they're more energetic and dedicated. Um, and again, I think it's the perspective you get as being a patient um, and in how you treat the person on the other side of the stethoscope again, um, as, as a physician, if you really value um, and you can really understand where, where they're coming from and how they feel, the vulnerability. It's uh, something that, because in med school, as an athlete, this was not an issue at all for me. Um, and then now on sort of the other side of the table, um, I really appreciate seeing how much energy it takes for people um, with visible, truly with visible uh, disabilities to accomplish what they do. So hopefully that answers the question. It's really a more the merrier. It's sort of like a party, the more different, the variety of people make it interesting and keep it interesting, so. Yeah, no, that's interesting. <laughs> interesting what you said about the extra work involved in, uh, Blake, you hinted at this during your, um, your introductory component of the, the panel about how much like extra work it took to, um, to learn. And, and, and this is like a, a common theme with people with disabilities. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Sure. Um, the uh, kind of the extra work and then I, I would even say it goes a little farther than that. There's a certain amount of extra self-knowledge that's required. You know, the know thyself that's above the Oracle in Delphi is I think directed specifically at people dealing with disabilities um, because uh, 
you know, you could go around the room when studying for, you know, histology and say, hey, what are you guys going to do? And people would say what they were going to do. And I'm like, well, shit, I can't believe any of that because I'm not neurotypical. I have no idea if that's going to work for me. And so, um, you know, and there was no one else to ask. There were, you know, and uh, there was a small, small community of dyslexic med students, but, you know, we're all more different than we are alike. And, you know, I, I don't want to, using imagination for seeing folks with other kinds of disabilities, I imagine they go through a similar process where it's not just that you have to do extra work. I have to, I have to prep a patient before I see them in clinic. We have very busy clinics here and I know that's just extra work for me, but more to the point, I have to know what I'm fast at and what I'm slow at. And I'm at 40, I'm finally figuring it out. And I think for folks that don't have disabilities that don't have to um, uh, know, you know, they can trust the common wisdom. They can trust the advice of what the other kids, the other med students, the other residents are doing. And so I think that extra work has a layer on top of it because those of us that do well, at some point the gift was given us to help us learn about ourselves and learn about our disabilities and develop those workarounds and figure out what we're good at and figure out what we're bad at and help us to learn always to acknowledge when we need help or we can't do something. So uh, that's what comes to my mind when, when, when talking about that, that extra layer of work you have to do when you have a disability. You know, I just want to encourage also the panelists as you guys get ideas or want to like riff off of or comment on each other's um, comments. Don't, I don't know, it doesn't have to be me asking the question and you responding, although it's been very organized and well run up until this point. But, you know, feel free to comment when something pops into your mind. So um, my take. How did your own experience with bacterial meningitis play a role in your being down the hall at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and choosing pediatrics? And what was it like applying for residency with a disability? Did you talk about it in your application, in interviews? And like, what would you advise other students to do when applying to residency? So I guess that's a two part. Why pediatrics and how is it applying with the discipline? Um, yeah, um, so I think um, I was, um, so when I was little, I, as I mentioned in my intro, I had a lot of different procedures growing up and um, the majority of the procedures that I had were these limb lengthening procedures because the meningitis damaged my growth plates in both my legs and my left arm. So um, the limb lengthening procedures, we'd go down to a hospital in Baltimore in order to, to do them. And it's um, a pretty lengthy, it's about a six month process in total. So what they do is they, they take the, the bone that they want to lengthen or correct the alignment on and they um, artificially break it in the middle. And then they put in um, pins on either side of the break that connect through the skin to this external fixator on the outside. And then every day I would turn different screws on the fixator to pull the two halves of the bone apart. And so that would both allow the bone to grow and also to collect any alignments um, that they needed to correct. Um, so we would basically live on the hospital campus for, for three months or so during the summer and then go back home um, when the school year started. Um, but um, I was basically living with all other patients my age um, every summer going through these procedures and going to the hospital every day for, for PT twice a day. Um, so I was pretty um, immersed within this, this setting growing up and was mostly around pediatric patients. There were a few adult patients too, but most of the time it was just um, us as kids just going through physical therapy together. And it was a really well-designed um, program at the hospital. The, the physical therapists were, worked really closely with um, all of the, the physicians, the PAs, the, the nursing staff. Um, so it was a really wonderful and, and kind of holistic uh, center in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, 
that is where my interest in medicine started. And then um, when I, I went to college being pre-med and then um, did a lot of shadowing um, and volunteering all within pediatric settings, because that was my whole exposure was within this children's hospital. Um, and all the people that I knew in medicine were pediatric um, physicians. Um, and then when I got to medical school, I kind of had an inkling that I would go into pediatrics, but it was pretty immediately confirmed um, once I did my pediatrics rotation. And um, something that I really love about pediatrics is just how um, we really try, we really think a lot about the experience of the, the child going through uh, treatment and, and wrestling with their, their disease. And I really loved how we focused so much more on the experience within pediatrics um, and how we cared a lot about like encouraging them to, to, to do whatever they wanted. Um, and um, it, I was really, really drawn to pediatrics that way. And um, I think another part of it too was just, I felt really safe within the department. I felt like all of my colleagues were really open to, to hearing my perspective and um, the pediatrics department here cares so much about diversity and inclusion. And it just felt like a really comfortable place for me to, to do my training. Um, and I have gotten that sense from pediatrics as a field um, as well. And then um, in terms of the second part of your question about applying to residency, um, I, I, I did talk quite a bit about um, my own story um, when I was applying to residency. It's such a huge part of why I'm here, um, why, why I wanna do this, this work. And it felt, um, it felt like it was just an important part of myself to share. And I figured if there was any, any program that um, thought it would be too challenging to take me on or too much of a risk to take me on because of this need for possible accommodations, then that's, that wasn't a place that I wanted to, to train. And um, so I, um, I, I did, I wrote my personal statement um, about, mostly about um, my own experiences, and it came up quite a bit in interviews. And um, I think that it is a a pretty privileged thing to be able to disclose my my disability so confidently um, and I know that's not the case for for others um, so I know the decision whether to disclose or not is very personal um, but for me it felt like this was an important part of who I was and something that I wanted people to know um, and I, I felt like it brought certain certain strengths um, along with it so um, uh, I, I, I did talk about it quite a bit and um, have um, all of the things that I, I found about pediatrics when I was training as a medical student here, I found to be true as a resident. Um, it's been a really wonderful and supportive program to be a, a part of. So I've been very lucky. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting just in speaking about uh, your experience with the limb lengthening, you wrote um, this piece in uh, JAMA, a piece of my mind about um, which you talked about that experience, but you contrasted that experience, which you had with, you know, you said that you almost look forward to your summers in Baltimore when you would get these limb lengthening, not because of the surgery, but because of the community and the understanding of the people that were around you. And in the article, you contrast that with like the understanding of the people back in school when you would go home or even like the attitude of your non-disabled classmates in medical school. I was wondering if you could inform our audience about that. Yeah, um, I think the, the center in Baltimore was really a special place because we were all really going through exactly the same thing. So there's um, there was a lot of, you know, that feeling of being part of part of a bigger group of people that understood exactly what you were going through. Um, and, and it was, I mean, it was, it definitely came with its own challenges. I think no kid really looks forward to summer of, of going through this medical procedure, but um, we, we had quite the family there and it was really, 
really special. We had all these karaoke nights. Um, I never became a Paralympian myself, but we had a lot of wheelchair races in the in the hospital parking lot, which were probably a little bit dangerous, but mostly really fun. Um, and um, I think growing up, it was um, harder when I was younger, going back to to where we where I lived in Rhode Island and I have such wonderful friends from from back home but um it's definitely a little bit different I don't think people quite understood what I was really going through I had some friends who would ask me if I would take the fixators off at night to sleep so um people didn't fully understand um and I think in medical school I think early on in medical school um I think I would talk about going through these procedures and and realize that, you know, um, until you until you kind of have a disability, you don't always fully see the challenges that that people face. And so you don't always see the the structural challenges with the buildings that we that we have all our classes in. People don't see like the challenges with um, had a really hard time on my surgery rotation. I don't think people fully understood that until I pointed it out to them. Um, and I think the, that awareness is growing quite a bit. And I have, um, I am surrounded by very considerate, very thoughtful people who, who have come to me later and have thought about all of these, um, these things and all of these um, factors that I think about on a daily basis. Um, but they start to pick up here and there just because the, the conversation around disability has really grown. And so that's been really encouraging, but I think there's still a lot of work. I think in medicine, we still think of provider as a separate entity than patient. And, um, and I think that's, that could still use a lot of work. Yeah, I'm wondering, like Sherry, Sharon, if you have any thoughts of like how people are educated in medical school about caring for patients with disabilities and just disability in general. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the reality is that we're in medicine, particularly, we're still like emerging in the very early phase of emerging out of thinking about disability fairly strictly through the medical model. And, um, you know, everything, if we think about how disability is characterized through most medical school curriculums, it's still, you know, the, the traditional paradigm of pathology. <laughs> how do you identify the pathology? How do you treat the pathology in order to remove the pathology <laughs> rather than, um, thinking about, or, how, you know, reverse it, right? Like how do you get people back to their, you know, state of health? And so, um, and, you know, in the medical model, if you don't, if someone doesn't return to this, our perception of a perfect state of health, then, you know, the, the um, drive is to keep trying, right? Like the, the sense like, oh, we failed, we need to keep working at it until they are back in that perfect state of health. Whereas, um, you know, the, the current, model of um, thinking about disability more broadly, both in the US and internationally has far evolved, you know, into more of a social model and then even beyond that into more of a human rights model or a disability justice model where, you know, you can live proud um, and fully as a person with a disability, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you know, if there is a problem, it's with the environment around you, not with the individual. And so that's a pretty radical way of thinking about disability when you're in a healthcare environment. And, um, and I think that we still don't do much to even introduce a lot of those concepts to medical students um, you know, within our medical education paradigms across the US. Um, one thing, you know, I, I do think that um, clearly you know, in medical school curriculum, there's been a, a lot of uh, progress towards thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, cultural competency, um, working with diverse populations, and that's certainly been advanced, but I think that very frequently disability is not presented as part of that curriculum um, or as part of the conversation around how we as clinicians can provide the best uh, uh, culturally competent care to disability as a diverse population rather than as um, something that needs to be cured or fixed. So that's probably getting a little in the weeds, but I, I do think that's where we're at <laughs> for the most part. 
No, it's like 18 years later and people are very confused that I'm not still doing physical therapy. Well, I think what I haven't recovered at this point, I'm pretty unlikely to recover. Yeah. But people mean well, but you know, you're, you're the one who introduced me to a lot of these concepts, I have to say, Sherry, which like really blew my mind and I just could not wrap my head around at the time, probably because of a lot of anger I had being paralyzed at age 30 so suddenly and having, you know, but um, I was like, but there is something wrong. There is something wrong. My spinal cord has a contusion and the nerve, the signals are not getting through and just, but I, I couldn't really leave that medical model. But I think people do have their own journey and, you know, it's like, it takes time. I think to cope and adjust. And in some cases, some people are never able to see the benefit of their disability because their disability is either so disabling or their social conditions are such that, yeah. you know, that it really, they're just struggling to live. Mm -hmm. You know, we're fortunate to that we're not in that camp. But, um, you know, this is something we often talk about, about like overcoming, you know, and the, which I call the O word, how like it's never, you know, the, the goal isn't just to overcome, the goal is to live and to adapt and to um, thrive. But mm -hmm. when, when you say overcoming, then um, you, you, oh, say seeing a zoom icon on my other screen pop up here that was very scary um so um pete, pete if i could add to that i think another one of those other complicated words that we use a lot in medicine is suffered you know um i'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on that um you know you know taking our journeys as an example you know i acquired a spinal cord injury at a very young age and um have had 40 years to adjust to that identity. Whereas, um, you know, you experienced uh, a spinal cord injury much later in life and had a much, you know, as an adult, a much different process of, um, you know, moving towards a positive disability self-identity. And, um, and I know, you know, through most of my adulthood, I've, it's always struck me as problematic when if I, read my own chart and have a primary care physician talk about the fact that I suffered a spinal cord injury <laughs> in childhood because I've never felt as though I was suffering from my spinal cord. I mean, sure, on a bad day, things happen, but um, for the most part, you know, I've never, I've never seen as something I've suffered through for the most part. And so, um, I think that's a loaded word too. Although there are certainly conditions where people are suffering and even with something like an SCI, everyone I think experiences those feelings of grief for, for a period of time. I don't know, it's just a complicated word. It is, there's a lot of complicated words. Inspirational is another one. That's, that's what I call the I word. Mm -hmm. yeah, unfortunate, the way we talk about our patients, I read once in my chart, that I was an unfortunate 30 something year old man. And I was yeah. like, come right. on. Right. <laughs> come on. I'm not that unfortunate. Just, <laughs> but why do we have I have a spinal cord injury. What's that? Why do we have to add that word? It's that's totally unnecessary. You right? know, 30 year old <laughs> with a spinal cord injury. Yeah. Take unfortunate. Back. Yeah. You didn't suffer it. I mean, you may have felt as though you were suffering. That's up to you. That's not up to the doctor to decide whether you're suffering. You know, what you're, you're a 30 year old man who experienced, who has a spinal cord injury, whether you're suffering from it or you're unfortunate, that's up to you, not them. <laughs> um, Blake, I bought your book, the first book of your trilogy. Uh, I was just like, I want to read all of them immediately. If I could download them directly to my brain, I'm going to read the first uh, sentence from the, the first chapter of your second novel. And you wrote, okay, this is so great. 
Francesca did not realize she had used an indefinite pronoun until it began to kill her patient. Someone, no one knew who, had brought the young woman into the infirmary with an unknown curse written around her lungs. Francesca had cast several golden sentences into a patient's chest, hoping to dispel the malicious text. Had it gone well, she would have pulled the curse out of the woman's mouth, but the curse's style had been robust, and one of Francesca's mistakenly ambiguous pronouns had pushed the curse from the girl's lungs to her heart. There, the spiteful text had bound the one beating organ into silence. Wow. What was your, you, you hooked me, I tell you. What was your inspiration for, for writing these novels and how did your identity as a doctor with a disability influence and inform these words and ideas? Well, thank you so much for, for digging up the old books. I haven't uh, thought about those in a while. Um, uh, but the, yeah, those three books were uh, a, a pretty wild ride. <laughs> You end up reading them you'll recognize them as the first book written as a pre-med the second one written as a med student on the clerks and wards and then the third book which is really dark was written during my intern year so uh, <laughs> you'll get a, a flavor for that the um the, yeah the inspiration for those books you came from i was a freshman in college and taking notes um, and the guy next to me looked over and he, I write in a phonetic shorthand, what I don't know a word, I've, I've never heard a word, I don't know how to spell it. And uh, he, you know, it was a high powered uh, cutthroat college and he looked at me and said, wow, I guess you really did ride the short bus if you write, if you have to write like this. And I have this insane image of like pulling the words off of the page and like hitting him in the face with it. And um, after that, I was like, well, what if you could? What if the words you, what if that was magic? Like, you're not Harry Potter, you know, it's not Latin, you don't have to say abracadabra, but it's just the written words. It's a lot more like code than anything else. Then the people that would have the worst possible disabilities would be the dyslexics. Because if something you wrote, if you, instead of writing a spell, you wrote a misspell, it might explode or something like that. And if there were magic users who were trying to heal people, that would be the worst possible thing. And it all aligned with um, all of my anxieties. Um, I, where, you know, all my life I had been misspelling things. And, you know, I, I have a horrible love hate relationship with the English language and the fact that E N O U G H and P L O U G H don't rhyme just sounds totally insane to me. And I, I just cannot see certain things in language still, even though I've become more neurotypical. And I can't tell you how terrified I was during my clerkship years of becoming an intern in San Francisco General, where we still had paper orders. I'm sure medical students don't even know what those are anymore, but you had to go down and write out what you wanted given when. And I was that entire year until we got Epic at San Francisco General sure that a misspelling was going to kill someone at some point. It never did. Um, and I got far more pages about my bad handwriting than about my spelling. Um, but it was all of those anxieties that I would imagine have analogous um, feelings for folks with other di di disabilities who are trying to make that transition from a medical trainee to a medical practitioner you know, this idea that a healer is anything other than the tip top, most, you know, pristine version of health and functionality has per pervaded what a, a healer in our society has to be for so long um, that there's, at least for me, there was no outlet, no comparison, nothing out there to talk about. Like, what's it like to have, you know, you know, what if my patient finds out his doctor rode the short bus? Is that, is he going to freak out? Um, and so writing for me has always been a form of kind of self therapy and exploring the kind of the things I'm most scared of. And so that's where those books in a way that I thought would be fun for fantasy and sci fi nerds like me when I was a kid, that's where they all came from. How so the dyslexia, you said has helped you in some ways, but like, what are 
just take us through what that looks like, what the benefit or drawback of writing a novel as somebody with dyslexia. What does um, that my, feel like? Yeah, the um, my copy editors hate me. Um, the you know the the with writing a novel, it's actually in in many ways much much easier than in medicine because. I do most of my thinking with my audio cortex and do almost no thinking with my visual cortex. Um, and so when I write, I'm really just taking dictation from my bizarre brain and imagination. Um, and when I write everything out um, and I have spell check and I have all these forms of uh, accommodation, um, I am able to produce something that is close enough that a neurotypical person can find and correct. Um, but the really the hardest part is my a lot of my work rounds end up bringing things that um, that are actually harder for a neurotypical person because like homophones and homonyms are almost invisible to me. So like the words which and two or, you know, I can handle those. But there are a lot of words like that, like taught, like to pull or to teach, like they are hidden in my words because they all encode for the same phonemes into my brain. They're all the same. But to a neurotypical person, they mean totally different things. And so that can be incredibly difficult to get all those homophones and homonyms out because they, it takes a certain kind of person who's extremely good at copy editing to catch them all, especially when you have a dyslexic brain, like sneaking them in to a 300 word novel. And so compared to other novelists, I know I am copy edited about twice as much, needfully so, and uh, with appreciation. And I still get letters to this day, never from my neurotypical readers, but saying like, oh, on page 372 and whatever you meant to write, uh, you know, I can't think of a particular homonym or homophone that I, I substitute for each other, but they're still in there and they sneak through all of it. And um, if you read my clinic notes, they're definitely in there because I dictate most everything because the dictation software is a much, much better speller than I am. Um, and you just have to not be too embarrassed and you have to you know, work real hard not to catch the things that actually matter or would damage a patient. Thanks for that. That's so interesting. Um, Sharon, we, uh, we have a question from, uh, from the chat that sort of aligns with something that I was uh, wanting to ask also. I mean, that everyone has a different responses to the onset of disability. Um, did you ever have a time of recovery or being on temporary disability before you could pivot to your new way of still being in medicine? This for me, Sharon? Yes. Sorry. Um, let's and see. I can't hear you that well. Can you speak up? Oh, yeah. Let me scoot up even more. Okay. So basically, um, this all happened really quickly. Um, it, it was surprising. And um, I really didn't have much of a, of a plan um, other than, number one, keep my alveoli open, do whatever I could to um, maintain uh, optimistic because I really felt strongly that my patients who, who I saw who maintained um, a sense of humor and who were very optimistic about their future, realistic but optimistic, that they seemed to do the best. Um, so no, I really didn't have much time to, um, to transition properly, um, but I did feel a lot of comfort in knowing that I gave myself a significant period of time, uh, nine plus months to get each and every patient properly situated. Um, and and uh, I worried about myself later because truly the double lung transplant was not an obvious um, destination. And so all the way up until that final moment when that was the only, only choice left, I was fighting all the way. You know, a lot of people are, are uh, especially um, when they're disabled, sort of mid-career or later, are uh, very interested. We get a lot of questions about non-clinical careers in medicine. And I'm wondering if you have any advice to people who are looking for non-clinical careers. Uh, one of the things that I really embraced was going back to um, 
a couple of things. And number one was uh, my philanthropic work. So I really embraced charitable work where I felt that I wasn't a one-on-one -on -one physician, but I could be helpful to a large group of people, be it the transplant um, games of America, which was also beneficial for me because it was just a ton of fun. Um, in addition to, uh, I would say people need to look deeply about some of their other interests. So one of the things that I would have been interested in if it wasn't just the, if it wasn't medicine purely um, was to continue my research, biomedical research. And so I ended up and lucky to be at Stanford um, studying some artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and that has been just fascinating. Now, did it actually translate into my pivot? Not really. However, my pivot is uh, public health. So I applied to uh, the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, and I'm now a proud two-month-old public health student. Um, so what I would advise is look deeply, think about those things that maybe in the past, if you were an artist or a musician, um, maybe a, just a hidden computer scientist, uh, embrace those things. And then maybe think forward, what, what is your legacy going to be? What would you like to do with the rest of your life that would make you, that makes you smile every day, makes you happy to engage and to put the time in? Thank you. Um, question from the audience, uh, Dr. Lunsford from Duke asks, uh, and this is to all of you, how do you all think we could get society to get better at recognizing ableism? He asked good questions, Dr. Lunsford. Small question. <laughs> right, but you can't, you can't really fight ableism if you can't see it. I mean, getting people to see it is the first step. I think a simple, one simple way is to get to know people with disabilities. Because, um, you know, when you get to know people and learn from them and, um, you know, understand that disability is part of, it's part of their journey rather than something to be stigmatized, feared or stigmatized. I think that's one of the most powerful ways. You know, so many people who either personally have disabilities or who have a family member with a disability, you know, it, it's just have a totally different perspective on being able to recognize, recognize ableism and call it out when they see it. Anyone else? I. I mean, examples of ableism are, are helpful too. I mean, I didn't really even know, I'd never heard the word ableism before I started um, leading SMAC. And I mean, when I heard the word, I knew what it meant immediately, but you know, things like microaggressions where somebody tells my wife that they're an angel for, for being with me. That's always a nice one, as if like just a regular, person couldn't be happy to be uh, with somebody who has a disability, um, you know, or like somebody talking to my companion or a caregiver rather than talking to me, you know, these sorts of things are examples of, of ableism. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question um, for the group. So it says, are you sure that divulging disability is a good route? If you have a somewhat invisible disability, you might not want to have people focus on that aspect of you at the onset of relating to you. Well, I struggled with uh, disclosing um, because I didn't really need to. Um, I would uh, wear my mask um, and have my trusty t-shirt um, but in professional uh, settings, I didn't really need to uh, divulge um, uh, unless it was for a safety reason, uh, mostly my own safety. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting thing. I think from the perspective of we need the world to be a better place 
And we all need to just embrace the fact that we're different. Um, and there's, we're able, uh, there's nothing wrong with us. In fact, we work probably harder. Um, I think disclosing is really freeing because other people will explain how they can possibly um, help themselves, help you, help their family members. So I think in the end, I think it's, it's very uh, humbling in the beginning to think about disclosing um, an invisible uh, illness such as a autoimmune um, illness, but I think it's necessary because it keeps you safe and it helps in the broader picture to increase understanding out there that there are many different kinds of people and we're all worthy and we all have value and we all add so much. Um, and we all happen to be doctors. <laughs> and yeah. the, uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. It, what I, this conversation I've, I've run into many, many times in the neurodiverse community and it is a thorny and a perennial one. And from every, you know, I personally have always chosen to disclose and I'm an advocate for disclosing for one major reason I'll talk about in the end, but for some people I agree that it might not be the way to go, particularly if it is not something that is a, a core part of your identity uh, that you want to focus on during your application. Um, and there's a lot of discussion in the neurodiverse community that you're, you're not required to disclose, it's illegal to discriminate against you if you're neurodiverse, and these are all really valid points. I become extremely anxious about applying to any place or job where it's not part of who I am, because I believe very strongly when I'm applying to someplace there also, they have to apply to me and they have to, I have to gay, I have to take the temperature of how they're going to react to somebody who is not neurotypical. Um, and, and I want to know what the culture is. And, you know, I've, I've had friends who argue back and say, well, you know, that means that they're all, we're all going to end up at the same 10 places. Like we need, like, we need to spread out, you know, and it's maybe a good argument that you, you know, you should get someplace and then help people like see that you're capable in many ways, even though there are some ways you're less capable. And, um, but I, I do think that the question asker, you know, there are many people who are at least in the, the of the, uh, the people in the neurodiverse community that I communicate with would strongly agree with you. Me personally, I've always been too too worried and wanting to see how the people interviewing me and the institution, how they react. I remember when I would go to medical schools, if they didn't have, if their uh, disability coordinator didn't have an idea what dyslexia was or what, you know, that was a bad sign. And like being out there and able to talk about it really was helpful for me. That said, the world is a very different place. And so, you know, I, I, I just want to validate that person's concern and that it's it's in, in this in my community it's talked about a lot and I, I think it's a personal question at different phases in your life it's very different when you're trying to be a med student and trying to be a resident and then you know once you're an attending and you're looking for another attending you know like it's a very different question at different phases in your life and so you think about you know how core is it to your identity where are you? Does it suit this phase? If you're going to med school, I would really focus in on how um, good they are at understanding accommodations. And it's a, it's a, it's a really thorny issue in, in the community. Yeah, we could talk all night long about disclosure. <laughs> and we have before. So we are out of time, but I'd like to give uh, each of you a chance to share your last thoughts. I'm sure that um, people would be willing to stay on for a couple more minutes to conclude. Blame it on me. I can start um, since everyone's shy. Um, I'd say um, I, I'd say my last thought would be thank you um, to you, Pete, and to Smack. Uh, into uh, the Stanford Med alumni group and the, the contributing departments. I know many of them were listed at the start of the um, event. Thank you for supporting this really important 
discussion. Um, and I hope we can continue the discussion. Uh, you know, I know that Stanford has hosted a conference um, that I assume, Pete, you can answer if it will be happening again, and if so, when, and if not, that's okay too, no pressure. But, um, you know, all these opportunities to come together uh, as a community and to have this open dialogue, I think this is where it all begins. Um, because you can't, you can't make progress, you can't bring an enhanced understanding about things like ableism to a broader community without talking about it and um, having both, you know, some of these difficult conversations, answering some of these thorny questions that get at people's uh, challenges and lived experiences as well as the opportunities. Um, so I think my last, my last closing thought would be, let's just, let's keep up this conversation and keep talking about it and, um, and, uh, and talk about it proudly um, as a, a really important aspect of diversity in medicine. Sherry. I'll say thank you as well. I was going to say something very similar. Um, it's super exciting to me that we're having all these conversations and actually the way that I ended up getting involved in all of this work from the beginning was through storytelling events that we had at the, at the med school. And I think sharing our stories and just being open to talking about these things um, is the way that we're going to make change in this area. So um, just want to thank everyone so much for, for coming and taking the time out of your Wednesday night to, to be here and to listen to our stories and um, excited to keep working on this. Thank you for founding MSDCI. You've launched the national movement, and it it. might not <laughs> even exist if it weren't for MSDCI. So You're too thank kind. you for teaching me a lot about disability also, I think. And Sharon? I also want to just mention again, welcome to, to, the, to the audience out there. Stanford is a very welcoming, accommodating place. And the more the merrier. I, it's just persevere and it will happen. And gratitude, make that a habit. Be grateful for all that you do have. Last but not least, Dr. Charlton. I want to echo everyone's sentiment of gratitude. I am tremendously grateful for uh, all the other panelists and all they've brought and Stanford for highlighting this and you Pete for making it happen. And uh, my final note is I'd like to, because I've, I've heard all of us talk about our gratitude and really the amazing things everyone has done. I'm so impressed with everyone. And, you know, we've, in a way, we've been so privileged and lucky and, um, Stanford has been a privileged and lucky institution. And I hope that as they move forward, you know, everyone can take a piece of this and realize that there are many people out there with disabilities who haven't had uh, privilege in the same ways and don't get to find their, um, their strengths. And, and you can take all the excitement and energy and hopefully, you know, as we move forward, we can try to uh, help those who have had less privilege, but are, are, are disabled and really get to where we are now. And that's my, Pie in the sky, hope for the future. Not so pie in the sky, we're working on it and uh, all of us can work together. Okay, so uh, once again, thanks to all of you and thanks so much to you and our audience for tuning in. Um, we have uh, two more big events coming up this month for Disability Employment Awareness Month. On Tuesday, the 26th at noon, there's going to be a health equity fa uh, faculty fireside chat uh, featuring um, Dr. Asutha, Dr. Holly Tabor, and myself. So if you aren't sick of me yet, you can tune into that. Moderated by Lisa Goldman Rosas. And oh, out we have two accessibility events with apples on with Apple <laughs> apples. That poll on the 27th and 28th. Both of those are at noon, focusing on accessibility features. Uh, day one on the iOS and day two on the Mac. And all of those events are on our website, which will be posted um, here on the on the final screen and, then, and are available at our website. And thank you very much to all of our sponsors. And um, QR code is going to pop up now and enjoy your evening. <laughs>